Good afternoon, and welcome to today's McGill Alumni Webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. The second week of March is one very few of us will ever forget, including those of us who work here at McGill. On Monday of that week, we welcomed our students back to campus after reading week. On Wednesday, we in University Advancement were celebrating another successful McGill 24 fundraising campaign. And then on Friday, we were all sent home and told to stay home as the COVID-19 pandemic forced a lockdown across Quebec and most of Canada. A mad scramble ensued as administrators sought to quickly shut down buildings and laboratories across McGill's two campuses and figure out how to finish the winter semester and administer final exams virtually. Since then, many of those same administrators have spent the spring and summer months figuring out how to resume academic and research activities for the fall and for a semester that will look like no other in recent memory. It's Thursday, August 20th, and in this week's McGill alumni webcast, How is McGill Preparing for its Fall Semester? We sit down with three senior members of the McGill administration to reflect back on the challenges the university has had to navigate these last few months and to take a closer look at what might be in store once students return to classes in September. Let's get started by introducing our three panelists. We have with us today, Professor Fabrice Labeau, an electrical engineering professor by training, and he serves as Deputy Provost for Student Life and Learning at McGill and has been at the forefront of much of the university's planning throughout the pandemic. We have with us Professor Anya Geitman, a plant scientist, uh, who is Dean of McGill's Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences and Associate Vice Principal of McDonald Campus. Welcome. And finally, Professor Laura Weiner is Director of McGill's Teaching and Learning Services Unit, as well as a member of the Faculty of Education. She's also the most recent recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from SALTES, supporting active learning and technological innovation in studies of education. Welcome to all three of you, and thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to spend an hour with us today. Before we jump into the conversation, a reminder that if you are watching live and have questions for our panelists, you can send them in via email at, to aoc at mcgill.ca, and we'll do our best to address them to our guests. We did receive a lot of questions ahead of time, so lots of material to get through today. So let's begin by traveling back to that second week of March. I'd like to ask each of you to reflect back on what that moment was like in those frantic days and hours when some fairly significant decisions needed to be made on very short notice. Professor Lebeau, perhaps I'll start with you and maybe with two questions. Um, so for how long before the pandemic was the university preparing for a possible shutdown of activity? And what from that moment in time sticks out for you as the biggest challenge or challenges facing the administration? Well, the, uh, I think we, we really started since the beginning of the year. Uh, at the university, we have what we call an emergency operations center that is looking at, at managing emergencies. And uh, what, when there was an outbreak in Wuhan, we started uh, uh, having concerns mainly about our students who were in exchange in that region. And as the situation was evolving, we mobilized even more to, uh, to be ready for something that ended up being what we, uh, uh, what we know today and the big lockdown that happened in March. Uh, in, in period of, of uncertainty like that, what we do is basically we start turning our wheels to, uh, uh, to get plans ready. In many, with many scenarios in mind, plan A, plan B, plan C. Uh, and I think what, what really strikes me about this particular situation is that nobody really imagined in any of our plans that it would go to the kind of reaction that the world has had to, to this pandemic, the extent of the lockdown, uh, the, 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 the sheer size and extent of this crisis. And it's really, it's really a, an uh, an unusual crisis because it impacts absolutely every uh, aspect of the university, the students, the staff, what we do here on our campuses, our students abroad. It's been a, it's been quite a ride. Wow, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, we'll talk a little bit more about some of those issues. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about some of the planning that obviously has taken place uh, since then to get things back to some sort of normal uh, for the fall. But let me turn to Professor Weiner now. Um, I imagine there must have been a tremendous burden on your office to help McGill and its professors move instruction from classrooms to remote delivery, uh, delivery seemingly overnight. Can you tell us what challenges your team face and how did you manage to pull this transition off? Um, yes, a it was a challenge. Uh, I think we very quickly identified, based on where we were in the term, that we were going to be closed for two weeks and then coming back with two weeks of classes left and then going into exams, uh, that we were at a very um, special point. So obviously, uh, ensuring that 
students and instructors were able to communicate with each other was a prime concern. So one of the first things we did was start working on arranging for Zoom licenses for everybody so that there would be the possibility like we're having now of having face-to-face, -face, if not in-person communication um, <clears throat> for the, the students and their, and their professors. Um, the second thing we focused on was really about reducing stress levels for everybody. Uh, it was a tremendously disruptive time. You know, our, our students were, many of them were trying to get home. Uh, instructors were dealing with home situations that were turned upside down. We were looking at the end of term. So we really focused a lot on assessments. So to help uh, instructors find alternate assessment schemes for the end of term that would be uh, still uh, fair and and able to assess student learning, but adapted to the context of time constraints and stresses. Uh, some big decisions that were made that we were part of was the opt to give students the option of choosing satisfactory or unsatisfactory rather than a letter grade. And that was up to and including when they had seen their grade, that took a lot of stress off of students. Um, and also an early decision was that we were not going to have any proctored exams. We were gonna have no software that was going to be monitoring students because the potential for things to go wrong with that and the stresses that it would have put on everybody uh, were just not worth it. So based on those decisions, we worked a lot with instructors to come up with uh, alternate ways if needed of finishing out the term. Mm -hmm. So when you look back now, um, how did McGill's professors and students do and, and was the transition to remote delivery to finish the, the winter semester as seamless as one could have hoped for under the circumstances? I, I think under the circumstances, which were extraordinary circumstances, I can't imagine that people could have done better. Um, I think, and one of the things that really has struck me all the way through is the tremendous commitment of the McGill instructors to providing the students with the, initially with the ability to finish their courses. Um, <clears throat> they showed tremendous flexibility openness and reflection, and we see that carrying through to the fall. Um, so I, I think uh, the experience was about as good as it could have been. Okay, great. And I, I, I noticed, uh, Dean Geitman, you were nodding along a little bit to that. So um, I guess you're in agreement, but I'd like to get your perspective as Dean of a, a very large and complex faculty. What were some of the issues that you and your administrative team had to wrestle with in the immediate days after the lockdown was announced? Well, I can only echo the words about our professors and instructors and kudos to all of them for getting everything uh, online within two weeks. That was an incredibly stressful period and we tried to coach them from our side as well. So again, kudos. I think it went really well. Um, as a faculty, of course, we had to deal with um, the two other aspects um, that had to do with this lockdown, and that uh, was research as well as individual student challenges. And so on the research side, of course, we do lock down our labs around Christmas and, and we know how to do that. But in this particular case, we did not know for how long. So it was really difficult to plan. So I, we essentially gave researchers three days to ramp down their research activities and make sure that everything that is alive stays alive. And that includes animals in our case. That includes plants. We have whole greenhouses full of plants. So we had to develop a protocol of access for the essential personnel to make sure that both animals and plants survive. And that includes animals such as snails and caterpillars and mice and all kinds of exotic beasts. And uh, so we had to manage the anxiety around that. In terms of students, we had to deal with all kind of um, relatively granular and individual problems. We had a graduate student 
who got caught in Peru while she was doing a course there that was credited. So she was an official university business, but Peru shut down. And so we had to try to get her back. She, her flight got canceled. She booked another flight that never existed. And we had to essentially hold her hand um, through online means to make sure that she doesn't get completely discouraged and run out of money. We supported her financially to eventually get her onto a military flight back to Canada. Uh, another student got caught, or a former student actually, um, who did his PhD at McDonald campus, but was now doing uh, a postdoctoral fellowship in the United States, had to come back for a family visit here and got caught here by the closure of the country and the borders. And so what um, his former supervisor did, uh, uh, she offered him the possibility to continue continue doing research in her lab here at, at McDonald campus until he was able to return to the United States in order to make sure that there was no interruption in uh, in his research. And so I think that happened at many international institutions. There's essentially a mutual aid program that uh, developed immediately and very spontaneously. Great, great. And maybe I should mention a shameless plug, but a big thank you to many of our viewers uh, and the, the, the larger alumni community uh, across the McGill uh, world uh, that stepped up as well. And we received, I think it was close to a million dollars in donations from alumni and others to help support students who needed emergency funds either to travel back to Canada from, from overseas experiences or to get out to their home countries or just to meet basic needs for food and and rent and, and whatnot. So I think everybody stepped up and, and played a big part in that. But but interesting to hear the, per, the perspective you just shared there. So now we're three weeks away from the beginning of the fall semester, uh, or less than three weeks. Uh, and it's a time of year so often filled with a renewed sense of energy on campus. Um, so Professor LeBeau, I'll turn to you um, for this one. What will the fall semester look like at McGill this year? And what can we expect in terms of course delivery, campus life, and the physical presence of people on our two campuses? Well, so the very early in the uh, in, in the crisis uh, in May, we announced that the uh, the teaching in the fall semester would be done uh, primarily in a remote mode. Uh, but we also said we're going to have in-person activities offered on campus if the public health conditions allowed for that for the students who would happen to be there. And so we're uh, we're gearing up for exactly that, that mixed uh, mode where a lot of our courses are going to be in a remote mode. Uh, but there's also going to be campus life for the, the, the students who uh, uh, who will be there. So um, we, we, we've made it clear from the get-go that our students, uh, most of them, at least in most programs, don't have to be here physically to be able to, uh, to study in the fall semester, uh, which means that uh, if they're not on campus, they will be uh, in a position to learn remotely. Uh, we've also devised a, a lot of a, uh, uh, remote student life opportunities, especially for first-year students, uh, allowing them to meet peers, interact, make friends in advance of them showing up to campus later on in the future. For our students who are going to be on campus, uh, a good portion of their course, again, will be uh, delivered remotely, but we will be offering uh, some courses, some course sections, at least in person, and uh, a lot of student life and campus life activities in person that they can attend uh, if they happen to be uh, to be in the area. So, um, except for very specific activities in specific programs like health science, clinical uh, teaching activities. Um, the idea is that for every uh, activity that is going to be in person on campus, there's going to be an equivalent remote activity. So students in, in both modes can actually feel that they're connected to the community and to the McGill life. Uh, and that includes, of course, our wellness services that will both be uh, available both uh, online and in person on campus. So we want to make sure that we can uh, cater to the needs of, of these two types of students, the, the ones who, who are on campus and the ones who are not. Correct. So I guess in that case, students who are physically unable to come to campus because of border restrictions and whatnot can still get the same uh, rich experience as those who are perhaps able to, to come to campus and have a bit of a hybrid approach. I, I do have two follow-up questions for you actually on that. Um, one is you mentioned health sciences. Uh, I guess that would include the faculties of medicine and dentistry. And I'm thinking uh, Schulich School of Music as well. So I imagine there are some programs um, that you physically need to be in the same space as your instructor to, to learn. So can you speak a little bit about what, uh, how those uh, activities will shape up for, for our health science and music students? 
So the, these are really the areas in which the, uh, there's going to be a lot of in-person activities, the, uh, the clinical side for uh, health sciences, and of course, the practical side for our School of Music. And so uh, both, uh, both the, uh, the, the faculties in the health science sector and the, uh, the, the, the School of Music have uh, mobilized to make sure that these are offered in the safest possible way. And the, uh, we're talking about the uh, plexiglass dividers for singing lessons, for instance. We're talking about full PPE, personal protective equipment for uh, the health science students. So this, these are offered in the uh, in, in on campus in a safe way. But also we're thinking about the students who cannot be on campus because there's going to be uh, some of them who, uh, as you mentioned, may, may not be able to join us, uh, in which case the, uh, the main idea in this case is to reshuffle their program so that most of these activities are delayed to a, uh, to a later part of their program. Great. So I think you did answer part of what would have been my second question, which was about measure safety measures that the university will be putting in place on its campuses to to ensure the safety of students and, and faculty and staff who need to be on campus. So I guess that will include things like PPE when necessary, plexiglass, and I imagine uh, face masks will be a requirement as well following the provincial guidelines, correct? Well, and I think the, what, what guides us in, the, uh, in all this, in this crisis, it's always been the uh, uh, health and safety of, of the members of our community as a first priority. And so uh, that's, we're following the public health recommendations on every aspect of what we do. And indeed, in specific situations, there is this notion of PPE, plexiglass dividers uh, that are needed for very, very specific activities. But for other activities that I mentioned, like uh, a, a normal classroom setting, um, most of what we do is really based on distancing because we want the, uh, to have a, uh, an interaction that, that is as natural as possible and a campus that is as safe as possible. So we're really basing a lot of what we do on distancing, the two meter distancing that is recommended by the uh, uh, by local public health authorities here in Quebec, uh, of course, combined with hand watching, cough etiquette, the uh, uh, increased cleaning of the uh, high touch surfaces, and as you mentioned, wearing a face covering when, the, when needed in public space. Spaces. Uh, but the, the whole idea behind our safety approach is de-densifying the, uh, the, the campus. We don't want a lot of people in the same place at the same time, so they can actually have that, that room around them to, uh, to respect that two meter distancing. And so we are really uh, in, the, in the last stage of, of preparing the campus for that new reality so that come September 2nd, when the, uh, our students come back to campus, uh, they will face the uh, a new concept such as a, a teaching hub. It's the one of these locations, one of these buildings where most of our classes will be located. So classrooms there will be on a specific schedule with a cleaning schedule between every uh, every lecture. Uh, there's gonna be specific, specific ways to access the, uh, uh, the teaching hub in a safe way with two meters Distance, distancing, staggered arrival times, etc., to make sure that this experience of, of going to the classroom is as smooth and safe as possible. We'll also be uh, uh, putting in place the concept of a study space hub, where instead of just walking into the, uh, the, the library to find a spot and study there, we will be offering a reservation-based system where students will be able to block a uh, reserve a block of time where they're going to have a seat that is reserved in a library space or another space uh, where they can quietly study, have access to Wi-Fi, etc. But all, all this will be done with the two meter distance in the, uh, in, in, in a safe way. So that's really, really, that's, that's, a, uh, that's what uh, uh, is underpinning our approach for the fall. Great. Well, thank you for that answer. I, I bet you never imagined that the job description for a deputy provost included many of these uh, elements, but it sounds like you're on top of it and handling it well. Um, let me turn to Professor Weiner now. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the remote delivery of courses. Um, what work has taken place these last few months to ensure that our professors are well equipped to deliver a high quality education to their students remotely this fall? Um, thanks, Derek. I think we've been working in sort of two uh related avenues at the same time the first is to ensure that the infrastructure and the tools that both students and instructors have available to them is as robust as possible and offers um, 
the uh, a great variety of ways of interacting um, and engaging to create really um, meaningful learning experiences. At the same time as creating this infrastructure, we've also been working directly with instructors to provide them with the support that they need to adapt their courses and teaching to this new environment. So I can give you um, examples. We've uh, we will have added 35 additional software tools to the repertoire of what instructors have available to them. Some of them are quite general, like Zoom, which is used by everybody. Others are very specific uh, to biology labs or chemistry labs or music or um, many different uh, software uh, discipline related. Uh, we've also um, been working on uh, making sure that these tools are inter as integrated as possible into the general learning management environment that we have so that they're e as easy to use as possible for all concerned. We've also been supporting um, for many instructors, they said, we want video demos. If we can't be in the lab, if we can't do the field outing, we'd like to have uh, video demos that we can use. So we've had a videographer who's been working with those uh, instructors and training students to produce them as well to create libraries of resources that instructors can be using. Um, so that's all for the sort of infrastructure, but we've also done a lot of work with the instructors themselves to help them really rethink how do you teach in this remote environment. It's not just taking the class as it was designed. You have to think about Zoom fatigue. You have to think about bandwidth issues, access issues. You have to think about the fact that not all students have a quiet place to study. All of these issues um, mean that you really wanna take advantage and rethink your course. Uh, so we did a lot of work. We have a, a a tutorial, if you will, on our learning management system that all instructors were automatically enrolled into so that they could uh, become familiar with tools that or uh, possibilities that they may not have previously felt they needed to use. We offered over 44 different webinars and we had over 3000 participants in those webinars. Uh, we created um, many, many online resources. And our web, uh, the number of hits we had on our website uh, more than doubled uh, compared to the same time last year. And as well, an interesting fact was that not only were more people coming, on average, they were spending more time. So we really feel that instructors were making use of all of these resources that we developed. Um, we also set up support teams for each faculty. So. Every, every faculty had somebody who was our contact person. They knew who they could come to with need. We were offering custom webinars uh, in the different faculties, depending on, you know, somebody wanted to know more about group work. Sometimes they wanted to know more about how a lot of focus on engaging students and how to manage that. Um, certainly we've got numbers that show people accessed and, uh, participated and we have also had it's been really heartwarming we have had unsolicited thank yous from the most unlikely people and people that we didn't necessarily know instructors um, that were saying how much they've appreciated the support and that's really what's given us the energy to to keep going through this because it's mm -hmm. it's been it's been um it's been a marathon uh, and that we've been running at a sprint pace. So it's, it's tiring. Wow. wow. I'm, I think we can all appreciate uh, some of the incredible work that you and your team must have been doing this yeah. summer. Um, I do have one, uh, one final question for you on that topic, though, and that's about um, grading students. So how are students going to be graded? How will they be assessed on their work and their competencies? Uh, and how can this be done fairly and accurately in an online remote environment? Well, this is actually one of the more um, exciting developments in a way to come out of this process. There are uh, a few instances where due to external accreditation requirements, we are obliged to do proctored exams with some kind of invigilation, but those are very few and far between. Mostly what has happened is instructors are rethinking their assessments to get away from the mid 
two midterms and a final that are uh, multiple choice to go to what is recommended as um, really good assessment practice and to have assessment contribute to learning where students will be doing more frequent lower stakes assessments. They will be doing, um, uh, they will submit parts of their written assignments all the way through to get feedback. A lot of what were exams are being turned into take home exams or open book exams. So the stress is not on the memorization, but the it's really about thinking. So the questions are written in such a way that each student has to personally invest in the answer and really develop it. So there are uh, tried and true methods for assessing students uh, in a, in a non-invigilated way uh, that can that are done in many disciplines already. Not all courses have final exams. Um, so it's kind of uh, encouraged instructors to question, oh, that's the way I always did it, so that's the way it has to be. So there have been a lot of really interesting conversations that have occurred. And even some instructors saying, you know what, even when I'm back on campus, I really like this. I'm going to keep doing this part of my course, not the whole thing, but this way of doing assessment. This has opened my eyes. It's given me permission to take a risk. It's given me support to take a risk because we've been there to help them work through this and providing them with some additional tools. So that piece of it is actually quite exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it sounds very exciting and, and, and maybe does open up some new avenues. Um, so Dean Geitman, it, it, it sounds like McGill's making the best of a, a less than ideal situation. Uh, I'm curious what most concerns you uh, as Dean of your faculty about having this semester take place in a mostly remote fashion. What might students be losing out on by having to learn from their homes and, and not be on campus as much as they normally would? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we could continue to have anxiety, of course, about um, technical issues such as quality of Wi-Fi, different time zones, Zoom fatigue. All of us now have Zoom fatigue. We don't want to see uh, people in 2D. We actually want to see them in 3D, right? Um, but for, for the time being, this is the modus operandi, of course. Well, our faculty prides itself to have a whole lot of um, hands-on experiences normally, hands-on learning, right? We have labs, we have fields we take the students to, we have a, an entire farm where we take the students to normally, and all of this had to be replaced by something that is provides the equivalent or at least close to learning experience. And uh, the good news is that our instructors are incredibly creative, and with the support of TLS, as we just heard, um, fantastic solutions have been found. So, for example, the students in our environmental biology and wildlife biology program uh, for whom it's, of course, essential to go into the field and, and learn on site what kind of plants and animals there are and, and identify them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have decided um, to uh, provide uh, both video-based instruction as well as in-person outings for those who can be in Montreal. So for the students who are in Montreal, there will be a, a weekly bird tour, for example, by our ornithologist and a weekly nature walk in the Arboretum. Um, one of the students or one of the assistants will, will videotape all these outings so that the students who are not able to be in Montreal or participate in person in these get the same experience or at least know what has happened. Importantly, none of these offerings are actually graded, so nobody um, uh, will be disadvantaged by participating or non-participating in these, but at least it gets those students who are able to come in um, out uh, from behind their computer every once in a while. Another professor, um, one of our departments uh, or programs is uh, food safety and food science, food preparation, and our very creative professors um, have designed innovative experiments that students can do in their own home kitchen. Right. And so the professor will be online and uh, will guide the students to do experiments in their own kitchen with very low key um, tools that should be available in every home kitchen. And so the students will have the opportunity to exchange and, of, of course, take photos and videos of what they are doing and exchange between them how the differences are between the, the different cultures as well and 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 possibilities of, of doing this and this definitely will provide a lot of uh, food for thought uh, during
during class mm -hmm. uh, discussions, I'm, I'm sure. Another course that will probably actually benefit from the diversity of backgrounds that the students come from is plant identification. Usually a professor will, would take the students into the field and they would identify the plants that are right around them in the field, right? But now all the students are in different locations. And so they will be sent out in front of their doorstep and, and collect samples there and take pictures and try to identify them and exchange between the students internationally the entire world to compare what grows in front of their doorstep. So there is actually um, a positive side to all of this. Um, the second positive side uh, will be that instructors might actually spend more time with individual students. Some of our courses are really big. There's 150 people in the classroom and the only time usually an instructor or a professor sees their students is somewhere sitting in the, in the classroom. Maybe they sit in the last row and then never meet them face to face closer than 30 meters away. And now all of mm -hmm. these students sit uh, right across a camera and, and a professor might actually be able to interact with each of these students more individually. So we try to make, really make lemonade from the lemons that we have been served. And through right. innovation and creative thinking that we are forced to do now, we can improve teaching. And I think some of these innovations will be there even after COVID-19 will be over. Great. And I have to say, every time I go into my kitchen to try to cook, that's an experiment in itself. And, and the results are, are not, not always pretty. So maybe I can get some credit for that as well. Um, but that's very in in encouraging to hear all of that. Um, I have a couple more questions. We did receive quite a few questions uh, from alumni and the community. So I do want to get to them. But let me just ask a couple more to you, Professor Lebeau, if that's all right, before we get to that segment. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the student recruitment landscape uh, has been like at McGill over the summer? Um, has there been any decline in interest and enrollment among new or returning students? Um, and specifically, what is the situation with international students who I know make up about 30% of the student body and are always such an important part of the campus fabric? Well, I think it, it's, it's great to see that the, uh, the interest in studying at McGill, be it in person or, a, uh, or remotely, is still very strong. And so we've seen the, uh, uh, a very positive reaction from, the, uh, from members of our community and prospective members of the community uh, during the crisis. Our admissions offices have, have continued to see uh, incredibly talented uh, individuals apply from everywhere in the world. So there has been no strong difference in interest in our programs. And, and as of now, if we compare our situation to last uh, last year, I think our enrollment numbers are very encouraging. So uh, the, the the situation looks positive from that perspective uh, as of now. I know that a lot of people, uh, students and their parents, have talked about a gap year or a gap semester. Uh, and this was really a big uh, subject of discussion at the beginning of the summer. But I think the uh, uh, over time it has become clearer to, uh, to many that despite the fact that the fall will be a different kind of semester, uh, we'll still be offering quality education. And it's, it's basically one semester within a larger degree and a larger stay uh, in, in campus life at McGill. So I think the, uh, a lot of people have a uh, come back to the idea that yeah let's let's do this and so uh there's really strong interest in, in being at McGill now okay so i do have to ask you uh about tuition and tuition rates um i know it's been a lot of discussion uh and questions raised uh about why universities not just McGill but across canada and probably across north america um generally speaking, are not adjusting tuition rates for this coming semester. Uh, we've received several questions from alumni uh, and, and others about that. Can you explain the thinking behind that decision? Sure, and, and it's it's a very fair question. The uh, but the I think the uh, the, the the main premise uh, behind all this is that I think we uh, we're convinced that we're going to be offering the same quality of instruction uh, remotely when it's done remotely as we would do in a normal semester. And and it's also true that the value the value of a McGill degree uh, remains uh, despite the, the this again this different fall semester. Uh, from from the the perspective of what we're doing, where you you've heard the uh, uh, the other panelists talk about all the things that we're uh, we're doing to prepare for the fall in this this different semester. We're 
increasing support to our students and instructors for remote learning. The vast majority of our services will be available uh, either in person uh, or remotely to people who are in person on campus or are remote. Uh, we're creating virtual communities and, and campus life experiences. So uh, it, it's not as if this was just a, uh, a decrease um, in, the, in the quality of what we do and all of a sudden everything is online and remote and bye-bye. It's not really the, uh, what we're doing. Now, the, the on the other hand, it's pretty clear also that a lot of people have been affected financially by the pandemic, and we, we definitely recognize that. And so um, in, in terms of access, which is the uh, access to, uh, to higher education, which is the, uh, uh, an important concern and a priority for us at McGill, the way we deal with that is not by re reducing tuition overall, but it's actually uh, by increasing financial aid for students in need. And uh, McGill already has one of the most generous uh, student aid uh, uh, systems and programs in Canada, but we're also adding uh, uh, adding funding to that program for this specific year. So we're really making sure that we uh, we're there to help our students in need. Great, thank you. So I do have a few more questions for each of you, but I, I maybe we'll turn to some of the alumni questions now. Many of which have come in uh, prior to our, our going live, and we have received a couple as well since we've been on air. Um, so just a reminder: if you do have a question that you would like to submit, um, you can do so by email at aoc at mcgill.ca. We do have quite a few, but we'll try to squeeze uh, some more in if we can. I'm also getting a couple of reports that some of the streaming on this webcast is uh, not as ideal as it normally is, so we're working to, to fix that. Uh, and the recording will be available as well at the same YouTube link, so if there are any issues with watching it live, we can certainly invite you to watch all or parts of it again, uh, the recording. Um, Let's uh, begin with this question. This one comes in from Stephen Fraser. He's one of our regular viewers uh, who tunes in uh, regularly from California. He's asking whether McGill's research and teaching budgets, as well as provincial government funding to McGill, have been impacted at all by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Professor Lebeau, maybe I'll, I'll stick with you to answer that one. Sure. The, uh, so um, th there's been all sorts of, the, uh, of impacts on university budgets throughout. So uh, uh, as you may imagine, a lot of, the, uh, of our uh, budget is basically driven by enrollment, so how many students we have. As I mentioned, we uh, it looks like we will be in reasonable shape this year uh, because of that. I will also have to acknowledge that the uh, uh, the provincial government here in Quebec has been very, very supportive of universities and so has uh, been helping us through this crisis in, the, uh, in maintaining the, uh, the, the financial stability of the, uh, of the university. In terms of research funding, there is a, there's actually influences both ways. So uh, there's new programs for, to fund COVID-specific research that, of course, we're engaged in as a, uh, as a, uh, as a research intensive and, and a leading institution. But there's also the additional cost because of the pandemic. So we, during the lockdown, a lot of our people who are supposed to be doing research in labs were not doing that research. And so there's a strain also on the uh, on the uh, financial resources of, of our researchers. So uh, it's 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 a mixed bag of pros and cons and plus and minuses. And at the end of the uh, of, of this year, we'll be able to uh, collate all that together and and have a better sense of the overall uh, the overall impact. But there's definitely uh, added expenses for the uh, the university but again I, I think it's it's fair to say that the uh, the provincial government has been the, uh, supporting us very well through the uh, through these times great thank you thank you for that answer uh, maybe I'll turn to you professor Weiner for this next we actually received a few questions uh, specifically about the remote delivery of courses um, specific to laboratories uh, lab classes so uh, there's two that have come in one that I'll, I'll point to here one came in from Xavier Rancoul who has a son starting at McGill this fall. So he wrote, how do you plan to run the laboratory courses? How will students learn without the experimental part? How will they ask questions and how will they be evaluated? And then Brian Donovan, uh, more simply or bluntly, he said, how are lab courses for classes in the sciences or engineering supposed to work? Um, well, obviously this was one of the big areas of concern uh, from the very beginning once it was announced that the fall was going to be remote. Um, Dean Geitman al already referred to some of the very creative alternatives that instructors in her faculty have been coming up with uh, in terms of uh, designing at home experiences, go out in, to the nearest green space that you have. Uh, a lot of, uh, there were examples of 
do-it-yourself kinds of at-home experiments. We're studying microbiology. Let's look at sourdough starter. Let's look at kombucha. That, that is microbiology in a different way. So while they're not getting the experience necessarily of manipulating the actual equipment in the lab, the more fundamental learning that you want them to have about hypothesis testing and the rigor in keep data keeping and analysis, that learning is the same. Um, so in some cases that's been done. In some cases there have been video demos that have been done of equipment and this has happened a lot in engineering and some of those videos are actually videos of experiences that students would have been observing anyways that in those some of those engineering labs the students aren't actually touching controlling the machines themselves uh, Technicians are doing that and they are there observing. So we've been doing videos with those same technicians that allow for close-ups and slowdowns and, and really allow the students to see what they would have seen. Other In other courses, we've been, um, we have licensed uh, different lab software that has virtual labs uh, where our professors were going through and picking out modules that were particularly relevant to certain core concepts in their courses. Uh, in other cases, instructors were saying, really the focus on this is not doing the experiment, it's about the analysis. So we will give the students data sets that they can then use to do the analysis. So. Um, professors were really looking on a course by course basis of what was the focus of the learning um, and coming up with uh, very creative and robust alternatives. There are, um, and, and some of these are, you know, commercially, uh, commercially produced, very high quality, very high fidelity virtual labs, uh, video resources, and then it's complemented with more in-house creation that are customized to the particular needs of our own curriculum. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, maybe I'll turn this next question over to you, uh, Dean Geitman. Um, this one came in um, from Brown Brownwin Upton uh, via Facebook. You actually referred to this earlier in some of your remarks, but she was asking specifically about what access will students have to their professors specifically international students who are staying in their own countries. So how is that going to work, the sort of professor-student interaction that maybe would otherwise happen in hallways and break rooms that won't be able to happen now? Right, so there's multiple opportunities. First of course, the, the course itself. And um, one of the challenges is the time zone, right? In this case, if somebody's sitting in India and following a program here, there's the time zone problem. And so um, the delivery of lectures uh, will either be synchronous, meaning that the professor delivers, but then they will record their lecture, put it online so that a student for whom this would be at midnight could follow it the next morning. That is one alternative. The other alternative is for a professor to pre record their lecture for everyone to watch it when they have the time and then use the classroom time to actually discuss and, and follow up. And uh, all the professors I, I know make themselves available, of course, not only for a lecture, a group lecture where uh, tens or even hundreds of students will follow, but also for individual meetings. So they will keep their um, advising hours. They will make themselves available either simply through email or then online through individual meetings. And as I mentioned, um, our professors who are truly kudos to them, um, take the time to make sure that individual students are, will be able to follow. I'm just going to seize this opportunity to interject uh, one of the, we, we think about students and that is at the forefront, but I think we have to give huge kudos to our instructors as well, because not only did they have to spend their entire summer to prepare for this time they usually use for research, but also many of them are actually young and have young families and they haven't had um, access to uh, childcare. And so many of them have to juggle not only teaching online, but having maybe a, a two-year-old and a four-year-old to take care of. And so kudos to our instructors mm -hmm. as well for, for dealing with this entire situation. Great. I'm glad you mentioned that, of course. I think, uh, like you said, there are a lot of young professors who are dealing with lots of issues, like, like many of us are, uh, plus all this added burden of getting ready for the semester. Um, maybe I'll just stick with you on this next one. Uh, you mentioned time zones, uh, Dean Geitman. So we did receive a question from Veronique Morris, who was asking about students who will not be in Montreal. 
um, for those students? Will the time of exams be adjusted so that they don't have to take them in the middle of the night? So I think many of the exams will actually be take-home exams, meaning that the students will um, not have to stick to a particular three-hour period, but can take home the exam and will have three days to submit it. I'm going to refer actually to Professor Weiner, who might have more details on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, so for exams that are done uh, during the final exam period, there are no exams that there is a requirement that everybody be online at the same time. They are all designed to be either open book, as Dean Geitman said, uh, sorry, take home as Dean Geitman said, or what we're calling open book. In other words, you can set up an exam that the professor can say, I want you to spend three hours on this exam. It will be available to you for three hours. However, you can choose that three hour block whenever is convenient for you within a 48 hour window. So uh, I might start writing at nine o'clock in the morning, Eastern time, and my peer might start writing at 10 and somebody else might write at two in the afternoon. So that is what allows for flexibility for time zones. And as we mentioned, um, students making sure that they can have a quiet place to work, uh, making sure that they're not competing with their parents who are working from home. So you've got three people trying to share an internet connection plus their, you know, plus their siblings. So <laughs> these are, and we have a lot of advice for instructors and students about how to have the most robust Wi-Fi connections or internet connections that you can. So nothing is required that is synchronous. So that, that flexibility is built into all of our assessment guidelines. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so thanks for that. So let me, this next question, it's a great question. I'm, I'm not even sure who to turn it to on the panel. I'll throw it out there and you can decide. It actually comes from a new faculty member at McGill, uh, Suzanne Bond, who's uh, joining the Department of Language and Intercultural Communication, I believe, in our School of Continuing Studies. So her question is this, what recommendations do the panelists have for creating online connections? As a faculty member, how can we recreate the student to student and student to teacher relationships that blossom during break time or in the hallways between classes? What opportunities can I, as a, fac as a faculty lecturer, provide to my students to help us all socially interact beyond the classroom content? Um, uh, I think Eichmann, we all ahead. have something to say, Anya. <laughs> I think, yeah, we we all have learned from the past month how 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 to interact and how to actually um, try and translate what happens in hallways and around the water cooler in into our own online lives, right? And one simple way without an agenda, just everybody have a have their favorite cup of tea and and then you talk. Of course. Um, that can only work with small groups of people, but you could arrange that. Uh, you could arrange a bigger group to actually uh, have breakout sessions. You have 100 students, you assign 10 breakout sessions, and then 10 arbitrary students meet together and, and give them a topic to talk about. Uh, assign one of them to lead the, uh, the conversation. That is one possibility. Of course, um, you can also encourage people uh, to talk without your guidance, uh, set aside group works that allow people to interact online in groups of four, all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think one of uh, the things that's emerging um, from, I mean, and these discussions are happening on campuses worldwide and certainly within North America, um, the use of video, recorded video. So a lot of instructors are talking about they record video introductions or they record themselves rather than always sending emails. Maybe it's them talking and it's a two minute low quality video. It doesn't matter, but that humanizes things. Also having students post video introductions. Hi, I'm so-and-so. This is where I live. This is what I had for breakfast. This is my favorite. It doesn't matter what, but to create um, some sense of human connections. And also to complement what um, Dean Geitman was saying about these formal uh, controlled, you know, you're going to go into a breakout room now uh, is to provide informal opportunities. So we have another uh, tool available to all of us at McGill, Microsoft Teams, which allows for students to very easily go in, create their own teams. They can create groups themselves, which can be uh, allow for 
interaction that's not always scheduled, because that's what many of us are missing. It's those casual collisions, they call them. Um, because if I want to see you on Zoom, I have to send you an invitation. You have to accept. It's complicated. In Teams, I can go and see if you're there and send you a quick message, and maybe we can have a quick chat. Um, so there, there are these kinds of informal structures and tools that can really help complement the formal planned interactions. Great. Thank you both for that. So let me, uh, I think the next two questions, I'll turn over to you, uh, Professor LeBeau. Uh, they refer more to student services. Uh, so the first one I'll turn to came in actually while we were on air. Uh, it comes from Judy Farrow. Uh, so she writes that the sudden shift to virtual delivery means many students will become disoriented and unmoored from the institution, causing them to lose sight of what they are doing. Academic advising will play an even more important role in maintaining student connection to the institution and student success in general. What are the plans to address the increased volume of individual academic advising requests to enable advisors to adequately and effectively meet the needs of the student population? Well, I think it's 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 uh, very it's uh, a very good point that indeed uh, we are trying to make sure that the links to the institution and and the links that the students have to their own path to the institution remain and indeed that means the uh, uh, academic advising taking more and more of a role in this. Uh, one of the things that we've done from the get go is actually move all of our uh, academic advising online. So uh, it's one of these things that can actually be done online in a fruitful way. But at the same time, we're also looking at the, uh, the, the experience of the students who are on campus, as I mentioned earlier. And we're going to start also offering in the, uh, the beginning of September the uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, advising appointments that the, uh, the students may want to have to get more of that 3D, uh, um, as uh, Dean Geitman was saying, that 3D encounter with people with the uh, with human faces, and so the uh, the combination of these two should be really the uh, our way to help the uh, the students and guide them through their path here at McGill, keeping them attached to the reason why they're here and the goals they have is part of the uh, what we need to do. And when we uh, when we put together the uh, uh, the the workshops that student services, for instance, uh, uh, organizes every year. We're thinking about that too. The, the, the academic wellness of our students is one of these priorities. Great, great, thank you. So one more question on this sort of note about the sort of student support. Uh, this one came in from Alana Zabrodsky, who's a McGill parent, I believe. Uh, she was asking about the availability of healthcare professionals on campus. Specifically, are you getting more doctors and nurses? Will you be extending the hours when students can get medical help? And what about getting flu vaccines to the students as early as possible? Um, so I know these are very specific questions, Professor LeBeau, but maybe you can address the broader question of what sorts of health and, and mental health resources might be available to students this fall as they, like so many of us, deal with this very complex public health crisis. So we will be in, in the fall, we'll be basically uh, offering the, uh, the, the our health support services, mental health, physical health, uh, in the two modalities, like everything else. So we'll have the in-person version and we'll have the uh, remote version uh, because we want to make sure that uh, our students can access these services in the modality that they prefer. And we also want to make sure that the, uh, in terms of mental health, our students who are studying remotely are not forgotten. So uh, this it's, it's been actually a very successful pivot to remote offering of our wellness services in March, when this 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 whole lockdown happened, uh, we basically took the uh, the same sort of a uh, uh, couple of weeks of a uh, rethinking how we're doing the uh, our business, pivoted to a fully online delivery service uh, in in March. And now, as we get into September, we'll we'll get back to that dual mode to make sure that both our students on campus and off campus are, are uh, served appropriately. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and, and maybe one final question for you, uh, Prof uh, Professor LeBeau. We received several questions on this, and you know, including during the broadcast. When is the university going to announce its plans for the winter semester that would begin in January? So we, we have been, uh, of course, thinking about what January is going to look like. And the, uh, earlier we said that we should be ready to announce the, uh, what exactly that plan is going to be by, the, uh, by September. So at some point in September, I think we're still on track uh, to be able to, uh, to announce a decision by September. I realized that the, uh, the, uh, the, 
this announcement will have an impact on the plans of everybody for the uh, the winter semester but also we uh, we have to take into account the fact that the the public health situation is very much a moving target and so uh, we can't just make a, a final decision too early because it may be too conservative and may prevent us from a, uh, from taking on opportunities in the in the winter so we're, we're really trying to have a decision out in september so people still have time to plan Great, thank you. So I know we only have about three or four minutes left, um, and I've got to as many of the alumni questions as, as I can. I know there were many others that came in, and I apologize if we didn't address them, although I think you've addressed many of the, the main themes and topics that people were asking about. Uh, but maybe I want to end with sort of asking each of you very quickly, if you looked at the future, um, and whether this pandemic has perhaps opened up new opportunities and new ways of thinking for universities. So again, I know you've referred to it in, in many of your remarks, but maybe I'll just do a final tour of, tour of the panel. I'll start with you, Dr. Weiner. Um, you know, when we think of higher education, we picture students in classrooms taking notes and professors delivering lectures and midterms and finals. Do you think that once this health crisis has passed, we'll revert back to that model? Or, or will this transformation that's been forced upon us cause us to rethink how we deliver education to college and university students? Well, I think some of the sort of stereotype of uh, university education is sitting in a classroom in a large lecture hall passively listening is true for some courses, but it prior to the pandemic, that was not the case for all courses, and that was not the the homogenous student experience. So I want to dispel that kind of stereotype uh, before we go much further. Um, but obviously, as, as I've mentioned, I mean, I've said to a few people, if this weren't all so awful, <laughs> there really is, um, I think, some positive, uh, there will be some positive outcomes, or perhaps, you know, we're making lemonade, and we're making really good lemonade, and so good that we're going to want to keep having that on the menu, even when we get back to campus. I think... Um, what Professor, what Dean Geitman was talking about of the students watching material online and coming together to talk about uh, their what they learned and to interact, that's known as the flipped classroom model, which has been a model that has been promoted as being really valuable for a long time. We weren't actually sure how we could do it given certain physical limitations that we have with our campus. Um, but now we are opening up opportunities to have many more varied. I think courses will not be seen as online or on campus. I think there's gonna be a lot more blurring of those lines with face-to-face -face interaction being used for really important, for really interacting and connecting. And activities that are more about reading content and reflecting will be done by individuals on their own. So I think it's going to help us make some shifts that we had been toying with and were curious about uh, before. So I think it's going to really help us move in a, in a positive direction overall. And again, I want to um, stress that I think the changes in approaches to assessment are also really valuable. And I think many of those will will stay once we're back on campus. Great, thank you. So Dean Geitman, I'll, I'll flip it over to you again. We only have a couple of minutes left. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the future of research. I know you've actually done some thinking and some writing on this. And when you think about the future of research and collaboration and, and scientists jumping on airplanes all the time to get to conferences and symposia, is, is that, going to be rethought uh, once we get through this oh, pandemic? Yes, an integral part of research is really that traveling around, and that could be to be an external examiner on a PhD thesis, to go to a conference, to give a talk at a seminar, etc. And we do that, it's part of our job, right? It's We think it's an integral part, but uh, these last months have told us that many of these things could actually be replaced by online events. For example, PhD thesis defenses. We McGill has been very successful and putting these online. PhD thesis defenses are the most regulated exams there are, and we were able to create this online. And then we didn't have any limitations on who could be external examiner. That person didn't neither have to make more time available than the hour and a half that it takes, nor did they have to leave their kids at home where they are and jump in an airplane and spend three days in Montreal. So it uh, makes actually the, the international relationship easier, not only for PhD defenses, but also for departmental seminars 
And as we have seen, several societies, learned societies, were actually able to put their international conferences online as well. Now, conferences are really tricky things to organize online, but they were successful. And not only uh, did people not have to travel there, it made it more accessible. It was cheaper. Um, a professor could send their 10 graduate students to a conference instead of sending only one because a single conference attendance would cost $3,000 and now it was only 150 instead. So I think there are things that we have to think about, uh, especially uh, when facing that larger challenge that will be climate change that is looming in the, in the background. And I think we have to think more critically about, about when we really have to travel and burn uh, a petrol-based uh, fuel on an airplane and when we can replace these through online means. Great. So perhaps it seems that necessity is indeed the mother of all invention uh, when you think about it in those terms. Um, so Professor Lebeau, I know we've covered so much uh, in the last hour together. Any last final thoughts that you want to leave the audience with as we get ready? We're I guess, two and a half weeks away from the beginning of the semester. Well, I think the, uh, it, it's important to look at the future. I mean, we, uh, we are indeed preparing for the fall semester. And as we said, the winter may be a completely different beast. Uh, and and uh, we're, we're ready for the fall semester. Our, uh, our campus is ready for the in-person activities we will run. Uh, we will do that in a safe way. So that, that is very reassuring, the flexibility. This whole, uh, this whole university has been showing all the members of the community is very reassuring. But I'm, I think the silver lining in all this, as Dr. Weiner was saying, is in looking at what we're going to keep with us in the, uh, in the future because of that. Uh, and I think Dean Gatman also mentioned the, uh, the advances we may have and the changes in the research field. Um, let's, let's focus on that. Uh, let's not keep track of the fact that despite all of us dealing with this crisis now and it's complicated and it's painful, uh, there is a future after it and we're going to keep some very positive things uh, that, that grew out of this crisis. So I think this is, the, this is my way of staying optimistic <laughs> in the, and optimism of this. Great. I think a very positive note to end this uh, this webcast on. So so thank you for those uh, words. Uh, so that about wraps up the time we do have today. Before we close, I would like to remind you that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to watch it again or share it with others who may not have been able to tune in live. If you are a McGill graduate who is not currently receiving our emails or would like to be added to our distribution list, you can visit alumni.mcgill.ca slash register to sign up. And the link will be available beneath the video player on our YouTube channel. I would, of course, like to extend my deepest gratitude to our three panelists, Fabrice Labo, Anya Geitman, and Laura Weiner, for taking the time to participate in this discussion and to answer some, some easy questions, but some tough questions as well. Um, I know you're all extremely busy preparing for a semester like no other. And yet, when I first approached each of you about taking part in this webcast, your responses were all quick and enthusiastic, which I think speaks volumes to the value each of you places on transparency and on sharing information with the community. So on behalf of the entire McGill community and our viewership around the world, I wish you the best of success in your work as you continue to deliver a top-notch educational experience to our students. This webcast marks the 22nd and final one in the McGill Checks In series that we began presenting in the middle of March as part of our commitment to providing our alumni and the broader community with insight and information about the COVID-19 pandemic. However, I will be back here again in two week's time on Thursday, September 3rd, as we launch a new series of Made by McGill webcasts on a broad range of topics where McGill students and researchers are committed to bringing their expertise to solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. In fact, the webcast in two weeks will be the first of a four-part series on environmental sustainability as we look at some of the work taking place to better understand and perhaps reverse climate change, environmental degradation, and many of the associated problems tied to global warming and ecological ruin. These are serious planetary challenges that will be with us long after we solve COVID-19. And so I hope you will be able to join us, join us again in two weeks for the start of this conversation. Until then, please stay safe and be well. Thank you.